Okay, well, good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome. We're glad you come out on this, our second winter lecture series. Today, of course, we're doing Civil War Soldiers, the life of a Civil War soldier. If you are not familiar, January 29, 1860, Kansas becomes its very fourth state, and President Lincoln is one, is one who raised the flag, the first flag with 34 stars. Unfortunately, all of that activity led to the parting of the Union. And so I thought, what not a federal, what not a better tribute to them to introduce a couple of folks that you can tell us about the everyday lives of the guys that were doing the fighting. So um, I would love the two of you to introduce yourselves and let you guys just kind of roll with them. All right. Let me see if I can. Man, there's this new thing. Mike, can hear me all right? Chasing me down. Oh, can't hear? No, Better? Cool. Oh. There we go. I can just hear that feedback starting to come in. Good? 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 Yeah. Good? I'll speak up too. I have a tendency of mumbling, so forgive me. My name is Robert Barnes. I've been a reenactor for uh, just about 15 years. This is my friend Logan French. Logan, how long have you been reenacting? Well, uh, how long has this been? Too long. A while. A while. <laughs> so uh, we primarily reenact as federal soldiers during the American Civil War. And uh, we've been asked to come out and just kind of show you guys the differences in our uniforms, the gear on the table, and that sort of thing. So the first thing that you guys will notice is I'm in all blue with a fancy pilgrim hat, and he's in a little bit closer to what you would imagine a Civil War soldier looking like. Um, this is kind of the standard that uh, you imagine when you think of a Civil War soldier. So the uniform I'm wearing, you would have seen early in the war. This would have been a US regulars uniform, although a lot of volunteers would have been issued something very similar. So the hat is a 1858, I believe, hardy hat. Um, it definitely keeps the sun off your neck. And it would have been issued both without the brass and the, the trim, but also it would have been issued a little fancy, what you would call your dress hat. So the bugle here, does anybody know what that bugle stands for? What's that? Infantry. Okay. Infantry bugle. The blue trim along the, the hat band here also signifies infantry. So during the Civil War, light blue would have been your infantry, red would have been artillery, and yellow would have been cavalry. So that's the, the distinction when you see that. Now if you notice Logan's hat here, that is a forge cap. Now, during the beginning parts of the war, as a regular in the U.S. Army, I would have been issued a hat just like this as well. This would have been my forge cap or my fatigue hat. If I were out cutting wood, doing work on garrison, that sort of thing, this is the hat that I would have worn instead of dress hat all the time. That also goes down to the frock coat with its many, 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 too many buttons. A lot of buttons. These would have been quilted on the inside, so they're nice and warm and toasty in July. And of course, you can see it goes all the way down to knees. Now, the the dress frock coats would have also had epaulets, brass epaulets on the sides. Of course, as the war goes on, they kind of did away with that to save time and money. The four button sack coat, like Logan's wearing here, would have also been issued. The only difference is, again, this would have been more of a work class. This is something that you would be seeing um, wearing with, in conjunction with the forge cap for work duty. So as a regular U.S. soldier, I would have been expected to carry that jacket and that hat in my pack at all times. You can see where, as the war progresses, that would be a little, little too much. So typically what they would do is they just issue one or the other. Um, U.S. regulars, of course, wearing this. 
this would have been more of what you would see with volunteers, volunteer regiments. So your 1st U.S. Infantry, 5th U.S. Infantry, they would have been wearing something similar to this, where an 8th Kansas Volunteer Infantry, 44th Indiana Volunteer Infantry, they would have been wearing something a little similar to this, including the sky blue trousers that were introduced in 62, I believe. I believe that's right. Um, something else that you'll notice that is different is Mr. French is wearing tall boots, where I have these short, what they would call brogans, or booties. Now, the interesting part about these shoes is there wasn't a left and a right. You would just wear them until your feet kind of broke them in a little bit. These would have been your standard issue boots or shoes, whereas these would have been seen more with infantry and cavalry, but, or infantry, cavalry and artillery, sorry, but some infantrymen did opt to buy their own. That's something about the U.S. military at the time that's a little different compared to now is you want to wear uh, boots from home? By all means, go ahead. You want to wear a blanket or use a blanket from home? By all means, go ahead. <coughs> the military had no problem with that because you know, it saves them money, right? So um, if we start discussing something, you guys see us slipping? Part of the reason, I'm not sure if you guys can see, there's no traction on the bottom of these shoes. All there is is a heel plate. That's why we sound like horses when we're walking around. That's the only traction you get. So on nice, smooth, concrete surfaces like this, it's starting to look like Civil War on ice. It's a little, little awful. Whereas, Mr. French, do you have uh, heel, or, uh, hobnails? He has hobnails on the bottom of his, which helps in wet grass and mud and dirt. Not so great on concrete. So. If you watch us fall, please don't laugh too hard. <laughs> we'll laugh especially hard again. You're staying on the spot, you can get away with it. So for um, sure. Yeah, so if we're uh, we're gonna start breaking down a little bit of what he has on his person. So first off we have first off we you can see this big Big thing right here, the blanket roll. In his blanket roll, he has extra equipment, uh, typically extra shirt, extra pair of socks, maybe some personal effects. Because this would have been your issue bag at the time. The haversack, or haversack, knapsack, I'm sorry. This is a knapsack. In the bottom portion here, you typically keep your blanket. And the envelope portion here, you keep your personal effects or uh, that sort of thing. The thing about these knapsacks is they're extremely uncomfortable to carry all the time. You can see the straps on the back here does not make for a great time. So a lot of times what would happen is soldiers would lose them. And lose them being tossed them on the side of the road wherever they're going. Also, what would happen is many times soldiers would go into combat and before they would be put in the line, they would drop their knapsacks on the side of the road. Drop knapsacks, would move on. The problem with that is with, with the fighting, they may end up 10, 20 miles in the opposite direction, either forward or in retreat. And then all of a sudden, the enemy is getting hold of your packs. So that wasn't very conducive. So many soldiers opted to do something a little bit closer to this. That way, all of their stuff's all rolled up into one. As they get uncomfortable, they can swap it, put it on the other shoulder. Just makes it a little bit easier. When it came to packing these knapsacks, and later, you're more than welcome to come and see some of the things that I brought in my knapsack today. The phrase that comes to mind when I think of packing is, is ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pay. You may think, oh, you know, what is uh, another pair of scissors or, you know, a pocket knife or another book? All those little things start adding up, adding up, adding up. Before you know it, it's over fully. You can barely get it over your shoulder and it hurts like heck when you're marching down the road. So many times they opted for less is more. They learned to 
adapt and to share certain items. I might carry the toothbrush for four or five guys, someone else might carry the, the wrench for our rifles, and so on and so forth. So, moving right along. On Logan's side here, he has his cartridge box, which would hold 40 rounds of ammunition. He has his belt with his cap box, with percussion caps for his rifle. He also has his bayonet. So, this is about what the ammunition would look like when a soldier received it. There's 10, 10 rounds of ammunition inside this package and 12 percussion caps. So this is about what a cartridge would look like. Right, the ball is like this in here. The rest is all powder. And that is your 58 caliber Mene ball. And this is a little percussion cap. So it looks like a little brass top hat to me. That's what I've always thought it looked like. A soldier would have been able to fire three rounds in about one minute. They're moving. That's about what, 20 seconds per round? Yeah. <laughs> you are terrible. <laughs> um, would you like to show the firing nine times? Don't have to run this time. <laughs> Just go ahead. So Logan here is going to show you a brief demonstration of what that would have looked like. There's the cartridge, pours the powder. Typically, he would then push the ball down. That's why when you're, when I showed it to you, you see it like this. So when he pours it, the ball is now like this. Then he would merely push it into the bubble. He would ram it. Turn the rammer. He's now putting on the percussion cap, and now he's ready to fire. Now imagine having to do that while bullets are whizzing past your head, people are getting hit next to you, there's all sorts of commotion going on, people are yelling, yelling commands. You're not sure if the guy that's yelling commands is your officer or another officer. And you're expected to do that three times in one minute. You can see why many times if there was a misfire, uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't even realize there was a misfire. Sometimes they would have three or four rounds in their barrel without realizing, oh, I haven't pulled the trigger once. So, uh, moving along here, you also have bayonet. Now, from what I've understood, there was only when it comes to mortality rate during the war, it's 1%, but I feel like that number is a little inaccurate. There's uh, some debate to that. If you notice, the bayonet is shaped like a triangle. Does anybody know why that is? The wound would not close. The wound would not close. Hence why triangular blades were made illegal in the Geneva Convention after World War I. With it being a triangle, there's no way to stitch the wound closed. If the bayonet's like this, like a typical blade, you can stitch it right up. Hence why a bayonet charge during the war would have been something very, very terrifying. Not only was it a apt weapon, but it was useful. One thing that they would do with it, they would take their issued candle and use it as a candle like that. Stick it in the ground. Okay. Something else that you could do with it, you could take your issued coffee beans, put it in the cup, and grind up your coffee beans. Meanwhile, you have a partner boiling water and something about like this, make a little bit of coffee. It also makes a great handle for cooking or, you know, that sort of thing. All right. Now over here on Logan's left side, we have his canteen for his water or milk if you're stealing from Missourians. 
You have his issue cup where he has altered it with baling wire, not unlike that one, making a boiler. He also has his haversack. His haversack is where he would have kept his rations, things like hardtack crackers, which, you notice this one might be a little bit different than the hardtack cracker you might be used to seeing. Most hardtack crackers we think of are square. This would have been an early war, 1861-1862 hardtack cracker. That's what this one would have looked like. Um, I can find it real quick. Tell you a little bit about rations. Per the Army regulations in 1863, meat per day, you would have been issued either salt pork or bacon, 12 ounces, or salt beef, 12 ounces, or fresh beef, one pound, four ounces. Typically, it would have been salt pork. That's probably the most common ration. Uh, I've heard stories about salt beef being issued and the men immediately throwing it away. It was so nasty, nobody even, they'd rather go hungry than eat it. In fact, there's an account where they were issued salt beef and the men got up some boards, they put the beef on the boards, they put a horse, horse's bridle on it, and they had a funeral. They marched it and buried it and even played taps <laughs> because it was so gross. They said, we're, we're not eating this. So salt pork, typically what was issued, if they were lucky, they were issued fresh, fresh meat. Uh, bread, flour or soft, soft bread were issued, one pound, six ounces. Hard bread, one pound. Cornmeal, one pound, four ounces. So this would have been, hardtack probably would have been the most common, followed closely by soft bread. Now it says one pound, Many times it was either one pound or 10 crackers, whichever, whichever came up first. They would have also sometimes been issued beans or peas, two and a quarter ounces, rice or hominy, one and a quarter ounces. And then per 100 men, 10 pounds of green coffee, or eight pounds of roasted coffee, split up between 100 men, or very, very uncommon, but uh, one pound, eight ounces of tea. Now, typically with tea, you wouldn't have seen that so much in the field. That would have been more of something you would see in a medical uh, scenario. Uh, most, most of the time, they're just issued green or roasted coffee beans. They would have been issued 15 pounds of sugar, three pounds, 12 ounces of salt, four quarts of vinegar, one pound, four ounces of candles, four pounds of soap when it was available, or 30 pounds of potatoes. Now, something you have to keep in mind is this is, this isn't an it, ration that you're gonna get all the time. Many times, you're lucky if you just got salt pork and hardtack. Candles, many times, we would share a candle. That's, what would I say, a pound, one pound, four ounces of candles between 100 men. You might get a candle and four or five men have to share that one candle. There's stories of soap where they would bring a block of soap in and they'd start cutting it to ration it to everyone. And there'd be guys with their hands underneath catching all of the flakes because by the time they were issued out, you're only getting so big of a piece. Many times what the men would do is they'd buy their own soap. This is rendered pig fat soap. Uh, it doesn't smell the greatest, but it cleans, and that's all that matters. I do use this in the field, and I am very, very thankful for it when I do, because when I go to eat, my hands are still filthy. It's nice to have a little bit of soap around. Um, what else can we really discuss here? If you can imagine, I don't have an example of uh, drawers. The underwear, if you will, men would have worn back then, if they wore it at all, would have been a canton flannel. Is that what those are made of? Canton flannel drawers. They come down to the ankle, they come up to the belly button. Then underneath, I am wearing what they would call a issued shirt, 
very, very scratchy material. There's only one button, because of course the government gotta save money. So many times what men would do, Mr. Prince is wearing a civilian shirt underneath, I have an extra here. You would just have someone make you a shirt and send you one home, or send one to you from home, or you might buy one, that sort of thing. This is definitely much softer and a much more comfortable wear. Um, their blankets would have been issued to them. Early in the war, they would have been a gray material like this one. But as the war gets underway in 61, they realize we don't have as many weapons as we need. We don't have as many supplies as we need. So they opted for what they call an emergency blanket. Where they're just getting them out as fast as possible. And again, they were also supplemented from home. They're great blankets from home. We're having blankets sent to them. There is stories of these blankets. They would say, okay, we need them tan with a brown stripe, right? They didn't specify the stripe. So many contractors went, oh, just paint the stripe on it. So they'd send them a brown blanket with a brown stripe painted on it. That's what, that's what the contract said, so that's what we did. And the government paid them. Contractors, right? So, um, is there anything you'd like to add, Frank? No? Would anybody like to answer any or ask any questions? They started getting the stripes down the side. Stripes down the side would have been seen uh, primarily in NCOs and, and um, staff like high-ranking officers. So, I think sergeants, or was it corporal? The sergeant with corporal has a stripe. Corporal would have a stripe, sergeant would have a, a little bit broader of a stripe, I think, and then it would just kind of go up from there. So that's where a bar of came from. And they'd be the same three colors. So, yes, if it was infantry, it would be dark blue. It would be dark blue on, on these, on the sky blue pants. If they were the dark colored pants, they'd be, they'd be the light, lighter color. So you can see the, the distinction. And then officers, they bought their own uniforms a lot of times, so they may have a stripe in there or something, but it wasn't regulated or anything. They were saying have to have a certain stripe. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, with the bagel, and you're a right handed shooter, would you shoot the bagel there or would you move it to the other shoulder? Would you back shoulder for it? Yeah, so there's a, there's a cast of switching shoulders and stuff, and I just, I mean, I would, I would imagine it depend on the individual soldier, because depending how you have it tied up, it may not sit below your cartridge box. If you put it on the other shoulder, then you have to pull it out of the way with your cartridges. Um, but yeah, there's accounts of them, and I think the accounts are more specific to when you get caught like this, you switch shoulders, and then kind of leads a bit. But yeah, it would be, it would be your best if you switch it to your shoulder. You always shoot off your right side. Any other questions? You want to show some of some of the highlights out of the pack and then make. What's that? You want to show some of the highlights of the pack and then they can come up and look a little closer. Sure, absolutely. Uh, something else I didn't touch on real quick here. Um, something that you would see on top of these packs, on top of your knapsack. You can see that there's these little spots here. You would have straps that would come through. And those are called great coat straps, although there's some debate if they're great coat straps or blanket straps, nobody can decide. This is a great coat. This would have been your winter coat. Now, most soldiers would have pulled this out of the company wagon as the temperature started to drop. Otherwise, they just keep it in storage, essentially. Uh, some soldiers, including some out of Colorado, kept them all the time because if you've ever been in the mountains of Colorado, it can be September, it can still be cold. So many times they would just keep these with them. But it is a, a, a heavy coat, and I can tell you from experience, I am very thankful for these, because there have been times where it is absolutely frigid. The first one that comes to mind, actually, we were uh, put on picket duty for probably the second night in a row, in Missionary Ridge. I had on wool socks, came up to here. I had on my wool drawers, I had my issued wool pants, I had my wool shirt, I had 
my four button sack coat, I had my great coat on, forage cap, I had a scarf wrapped around my head, and gloves. And by the end of picket duty, I couldn't feel my fingers or my toes. Thankfully, I at least had this to have some work because it was so frigid. When we came off of picket duty, it was 6 a.m. I remember we, we came through, our detail came through, and we came to grab this guy to switch, switch guards, and he was covered in frost. You could see the frost on his uniform, and I didn't know if he was just a really good century and was not budging or if he was frozen because it was cold. It was extremely cold. Typically, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the differences in great coats uh, typically were the length. The length might be a little bit different. It might be a little shorter for CAD just because they have to get on and off. Of course, for infantry, it's going to be a little bit longer. I think CAD had a fold down collar. And they, yeah, cavalry also had a fold down collar as well. I think there are some out there, uh, like a dark blue uh, overcoat. I think that was by the officers. The officers, so yeah, they were for just one officer. Something we did not touch on um, is shelter. Now, typically, when you see the green actors out there, where they're using these wedge tents with the poles and the great big A-frame tents, that's not exactly accurate. Now, early in the war, yes, they have those, but they quickly discovered well, you have to break it down, <coughs> put it in the wagon, and then start marching. Infantry is going to move a whole heck of a lot faster than those wagons. And there's times where the wagons, they're just getting to the next spot by the time they're waking up and going on to the next. So what they introduced in 1862 were what's called a shelter hat. So this is a shelter hat. If you notice, there's buttons and holes on each of the four sides. The reason why is because I also have a shelter house, and what we could do is button the pieces together and create a shelter. And with it being on either which way, we can have my shelter house, his shelter house, his shelter hat, his shelter hat, we can button them all together, we can tie them up into a tree, and we can have a nice little tent. But what's also great about it is because they are so small and so thin, you can put this in a knapsack without any real problem. Just like that. Now granted, it's pretty small. If you're very tall at all, you're probably not going to have a great night. Either your head's going to be sticking out or your toes are going to be sticking out. Right, Todd? True story. The, uh, a lot of them called the dog tents. Not quite sure where that terminology came from, but a lot of people suspect it's because the only animal that could get any shelter in it was a dog. Okay. If you're a grown man, then. something else we would have been issued are rubber blankets. Uh, Another one right here is an example. That's something that you can lay down on the ground and sleep on top of, keep the moisture off of you. Uh, many times what you can do as well is play it over you. There's been several uh, events that we've gone to where one of us puts one down, we throw our blankets over both of us, and then we throw one of those on top. It kind of keeps the heat in as well. Spooning helps as well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, some of the uh, other items that you may have seen in Knapsack, and you guys are going to be more than welcome when this is finished to come and take a look. Uh, with it being a little bit colder, may have opted to have my mittens in there. These would not have been issued. This would have been something that would have been either made by a Christian Commission organization, making stuff for soldiers, that sort of thing, or something from home. You notice the pattern, someone asked me the other day why it has two thumbs. Yeah. It's not a thumb. For your trigger. Mm -hmm. the trigger finger. So you can still work your hammer, still work the trigger. Now, putting a cap on is a complete other... I can pull it once, but after that, this thing's coming off because I need my hand. 
Something else I would have had in there, something else we may have seen anyway, is a hand-knit nightcap. Uh, I can tell you that this thing is very comfortable, and I may or may not have been seen wearing this at Aldi at 21st and Amity, because it is very cozy. And at night, it's very nice, especially when it's, the temperature starts dropping, like it has been here, a little extra warmth can't hurt. With it being cold weather as well, we might as well talk about hand knit scarves. Something else that, again, would not have been issued. Something that would have been made by a civilian organization or by, in my case, a very loving grandmother. Uh, I remember actually when she made, she made this for me, we were down in Arkansas and it was pretty, pretty Grove, Arkansas. Has anybody ever been down there? So they have an event down there in December. It is cold. It is cold, cold, cold. Um, something you may have seen a lot of soldiers carry. Some letters from home. Everything in my pack, for the most part, has a dual purpose. That's something that a lot of soldiers had. They had stuff that they could use for this, that, or the other. So letters and newspaper would have been great items because one, it's entertainment. You can read them over and over and over and over again. You can also burn them for warmth. You can start fires with them. Or toilet paper. You can also use them for toilet paper, which, uh, not to be uh, too crude or crass here, you notice that my newspaper is missing some pieces. And that is the reason why. I will tell you right now, that is the reason why it was cold, it was wet outside, I'm not using cold, wet leaves. <laughs> I have some newspaper, I'll just use that. Something else in, in that field that they may have used, if they had to, was just little poke sacks. You can find these anywhere, uh, just good for storage, that sort of thing, or toilet paper. <laughs> There's some hygiene items that I have up here. Uh, of course, the soap, like I mentioned, but also I have a little folding bone comb, a toothbrush and some tooth powder, some baking soda based. With the baking soda based tooth powder, what I do, and I have seen at least one account of this uh, happening during the war, you would brush with your baking soda, right? Brush and brush and brush and then you would take your issued apple cider vinegar and rinse. The vinegar and the baking soda is going to fizzle, going to fizz, going to help brighten your, brighten your smile. It's also going to, they say, freshen your breath, but I just smell apples and pickles. And then, the best part, you don't spit it out. You swallow it. Allegedly, the baking soda and the vinegar helps with digestion. Uh -huh. So you would just swallow it all. I don't swallow all of it. Uh, I swallow some of it, and then I drink a lot of water. Um, <laughs> it does, I will say, it, it does freshen your breath a little bit if it's 1862, but, you know, it's not nowadays. Let's remember it's a little bit better. So why do they issue vinegar? Why would they issue the vinegar? <laughs> so vinegar is, and as I've learned, Getting a little bit older, vinegar is wonderful. I have gallons of vinegar at home. I'm not even kidding you, I have gallons of vinegar at home because vinegar is great for a multitude of reasons. It's great for cleaning. You can clean your rifles with it. You can take rust off of stuff with it. You can polish buttons with vinegar, but also you can cook with it. You can brush your teeth with it. There are health benefits as well. So there's a multitude of reasons why they would have issued vinegar. I had the same question when I learned that. Why would they issue Mild acid. What's that? It's a mild acid. It is a mild acid. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very uh, it's it actually has a ton of great purposes, and um, I don't think I could go to any of it without my vinegar now. Like I said, I have gallons of it at home because cleaning cleaning different things, especially uh, some of the items that we. We actually use our original antiques, so they yeah, have butter knives and stuff like that. It's really great to kind of scrub some of that stuff off. 
Um, and it's cheap. And it's cheap. Dillon's has a great deal of it. In mm -hmm. case anybody is curious. Well, and baking soda. Both of them together are just a cheap mm -hmm. cleaner. Oh, yeah. Uh, even uh, oil and salt are a good one, which would have also been a cheap. So, this is what they would have called sweet oil. Anybody know? Does anybody know what sweet oil is? Olive oil. Right. Just a little bit of olive oil. Again, great for cooking. It's great for cleaning. It's great for just boiling stuff up so it works well. A little bit of oil goes along the way. Same with a little bit of salt. Salt has a multitude of different purposes that are great for cooking and cleaning. Uh, some other items you may have seen. I have an extra pair of socks in here. I have an extra shirt. I also have tobacco pipe and some tobacco. Maybe something that someone decided, you know what, I'm going to make a little bit of room in my pack to smoke. Keeps, keeps me entertained. It's something to do. It's a very social thing. They may have uh, had a pipe with them, along with a little thing for branches. And of course, your tobacco. A good handy pocket knife goes a long way. You never know when you'll need a good pocket knife. Rosary for those that are religious. Here's, here's one that I, uh, when we're talking about entertainment, here's one that I enjoy. Does anybody know what these are? Sounds. Rib bones. Mm -hmm. I have yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would just do like this. Just like that. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how often someone would have necessarily carried bare bones with them in their pack. However, in a winter quarter situation, <laughs> we can get the wagons and Mr. French here can pull his banjo out and I have my bones. It can make for a great evening. On the topic of banjos, a lot of soldiers did have banjos. And what was really interesting, it's a really interesting story. So they have the skin that goes on a banjo, right? We'll say it gets warped or it gets torn or it gets broken. Where the heck are you going to get a new one? Right? You're out in the field. What they would do, they'd take their pocket knife, they'd sneak up to the drummer boy, they'd poke a hole right in the edge of the drumstick. Just like that. Walk on. Drummer comes out. Ooh, looks like we've got a hole. Going to have to buy a new one. So, on the government dime, mm -hmm. they replace the drum skin, the banjo player gets a new skin for his banjo. <laughs> they were crafty. I didn't say they were right, but they were crafty. Another item that someone may have carried, usually for three or four guys to share, is what's called a housewife. This would have been where you keep extra thread, extra buttons, I have my sewing scissors in there. That sort of thing. I was actually discussing this before this presentation started. I'm missing a button. I have the button. I just haven't sewn it back on yet. So that might be something you guys uh, see me doing here in a little while. Something else that they may have decided to carry are books of some kind. This one is just a regular sketchbook, blank pages, and then a nice book by Edgar Allan Poe. That being said, going back to what I said earlier, uh, ounces equal pounds, pounds equal pain. Books may have been ditched fairly early. Uh, when you come and take a look, this is just an example of what you may have seen. This may not be what one guy would have carried or issued, that sort of thing. Everybody's a little bit different. Everybody would want to carry something different. And like I said, you would share. So Mr. French here might carry our toothbrush, or I might carry our housewife, and we would share. In modern times, he can get his own day toothbrush. I'm not sharing with anybody <laughs> this brush. Not doing it. Absolutely disgusting. Makes me gag thinking about it. <laughs> Some other things here wouldn't necessarily fit in a pack, but carry a pocket watch and a handkerchief, things that are probably would have stuck in my pockets. On the topic of pockets, uh, soldiers love pockets. Love pockets. 
there are surviving examples of jackets where the inside is just full of pockets that they sewed in themselves. Issued shirts with extra pockets on them. They love pockets. There's one where the pockets even on the outside. They just love pockets. They would put everything they could in their pockets. That way, if you lose your pack, all your stuff you care about is on your person. I have a, a nice cup here with period cor correct water. Anybody's interested? I'm just kidding. There's no dysentery. <laughs> Have some beans here, uh, issued plate, my fork and knife, my cutlery. Something about the cutlery that I read an example of is they would wait until they were almost black. And do you know how they clean them? You just shove it in the ground a little bit, wipe the dirt off, and we'll put it back in the pack. <laughs> We wonder why disease was the number one killer of soldiers during the American Civil War. It wasn't bullets, it wasn't bayonets, it wasn't even <coughs> artillery or cavalry sabers. It was dysentery. Disease killed more men than bullets. And we wonder why. And we wonder why. Usually just bad water, but that doesn't help out. Uh, I have my Hammer stack here, which that's what all of this would have been stored in. It's pretty much your kitchen on your hip. There's stories of soldiers with their haversacks that it would smell rancid when they opened it because there's just meat that's gone bad in there, juices have gotten out, just gone stale. Mine stinks, but not that bad. It's not pleasant, but it's not anything remotely like that. I think I'll skip on that part of the authenticity. Back here in the back, when you guys can take, take a look, you'll see my cartridge box that we discussed earlier with the tins. You would have had two tins in your cartridge box like this. There would have been 20 rounds on top, so 10 in each tin, and then an extra tin at the bottom. So what, what happens is, as you're loading and you're shooting and you're fighting, your sergeant would come by, he's behind the line. He's not shooting, he's behind the line. If you have a rifle that's malfunctioning, you hand it to him, he hands you your rifle, you keep fighting. At, when he fixes it, get it back to you, that sort of thing, you have a problem with your weapon, you hand it to him. But what he's also doing is he's checking your ammunition. And if he sees you're getting low, he'll pull out your tin, he'll pull out the package of rounds and refill it for you. So you don't even have to think about it. If you're frontline infantry, all you're worrying about is what's going on down, down range. That's it. So that's what that's for. And then here are my, my Springfield tool for disassembling my rifle. And this little corkscrew is for cleaning the inside. What, what they would do is they would take what's called toe flax toe, kind of a fibery substance. You stuff it down the barrel, get it wet, stuff it down the barrel, pull it out, rinse it off, do it again until it came out clean, and then you do dry toe and dry it up. And there you go, it's all clean. They did use uh, water back then, and what's great, because here on your ramrod, Threads. That's what that's for. Just like that. So you can clean your rifle. I suppose that's something we didn't discuss uh, a moment ago. Talking about firearms. Mr. French is carrying a 1853 Enfield. That would have been an imported rifle from England. That was the highest highest uh, imported weapon during the war. It was imported to both sides, both the Federal and the Confederates. It was chambered with .577, so fairly close to 58 caliber, they were pretty well matched. Uh, some minor differences. And then this one I'm carrying here is the 1855 Springfield. Um, you can see this little door here. Originally, 
it was issued in what's called a Maynard tape system. It's a mouthful. It is as silly as the name. So what would happen instead of putting the percussion cap on, when you pulled the hammer back, there would be a little tape that you'd pull up and just put on the cone. You guys ever grow up with the little cat guns that had the, there was a string of caps? That's a Maynard tape system. So you had that little coil of cap gun caps inside this little door, and you just pull it out, put it on top. Sounds like a really great idea until it gets wet, it stops working, and there's a whole host of problems. So pretty early on in the war, they decided to just go back to the percussion cap because keep it simple and stupid. There's no reason to get complicated, but it's the government, so they like to do that. Uh, both of these you would have, weapons you would have seen uh, early on in the war and throughout the entire war. Uh, many of the soldiers out west, so Fort Leavenworth, further west, would have been issued something similar to this because by then, it was old technology. It was 55. The war started in 61. You would have seen a lot of soldiers with these, but they're all old stock, as you would say. Uh, the second Colorado, uh, they came out of Denver. Most of them were actually old miners. Would have worn a similar uniform to this, carried 1855 Springfield like this one. They also wore hardy hats, but they didn't have all the fancy doodads on it. They looked like pilgrims in blue suits. Robert, mm -hmm. when the metal on the stock The metal stock, metal uh, deal on the stock here is a, a patch box. Typically you would keep a tool. There's a tool that would fit in there. Uh, cleaning jags, stuff like that would fit in the inside. Or you could also store a uh, tote on the inside there for cleaning the weapon. How much did they weigh? How much did they weigh? 12, 13 pounds, just about. Um, the reproductions now are actually a little bit heavier than the originals, funny enough. And this one I think weighs about 13, 14 pounds. So it's, um, you feel it going up the side of the mountain, I can tell you that much. If your officer doesn't like it, <laughs> something they can do is when you're in the line and you fire, you have to keep your rifle up until he tells you to recover. So you fire and you're stuck like this until he says recover and you bring it back down here. So if your officer doesn't like you, he can just leave you here. He can teach you a lesson, keep you up here like this for a while. Start kind of doing this number, and okay, okay, recover that. So this one, um, and granted too, once you put the bayonet on, it's much heavier as well, so it pulls it down. And I, I affectionately call this the 19th century social distancing tool, because from the end of that to the, to the end of the butt stop is about six feet. And that's CDC guidelines there, so that's a good one. <laughs> so how accurate were they? How accurate? If I remember correctly, um, they are accurate up to 600 yards. And if I remember correctly as well, a soldier was expected to be able to hit the silhouette of an officer on a horse at 600 yards. Notice it did not specify the man. It did not specify the horse. It just said something. At 600 yards, the shape of a man and a horse, you should be able to hit with a 58 caliber ball. And this thing is hefty. It's a hefty round. I read that the standard target size for the 600 yards was six foot by six foot. That would cover your horse and man. Right, okay. That was the expected putting it on a six foot by six foot. If nobody uh, could hear him, from what he read, Todd's also a, a reenactor, so he's fact checking on everything. <laughs> <laughs> what he said is at 600 yards, the target would be six foot by six foot. You should be able to put something within that six foot by six foot spot, which would cover a man on a horse. 
And again, three rounds of mint with these, I can't imagine. Did you have a question again? How much does that always cost you? We don't discuss that. Um, <laughs> that's be between myself and the credit card company. What's that? I don't think the government is issuing that now. Oh, no. No, I, by all means, I wish they were. Um, no, um, all of this is self-funded. Everything you see, either we made it or someone else made it and paid them a pretty penny to make. Um, I can tell you, for example, that this is a $1,500 rifle. Just the rifle alone is not, if that disappeared, I'd be very, a very, very upset man. The hat is probably 200 bucks, $250. So everything you see up here is stuff that, like I said, either someone else made, we made ourselves, or they're originals to some capacity. Maybe not original to the 1860s, but the style is similar enough to those of 1860s that we just kept it. For instance, actually, the, this uh, fork and knife combo were my great, great grandmothers. My, uh, my mother said, hey, do you think you could use those? I said, absolutely. Yes, I have other forks and knives, but I want to use my family's. It's just something personal. Carry my great great grandmother's stuff. Um, I would say finding a good group would be the best start. There are lots of groups um, here in Wichita, Kansas City area, the region. Um, Facebook is a wonderful resource. You can find a lot of great people that are willing to help. Um, when it comes to piecing together a uniform, I would say there's some pages on Facebook where you can find stuff that's used, lightly used, all the way up to, there's holes ripped through them. It kind of depends on what you're trying to do, what impression you're trying to go for, that, that sort of thing. And that's kind of where it really starts. What do you want to do? Like, what is the impression you're going for? So, uh, what Logan's wearing here, aside from the boots, is kind of what we would call like a generic feather. It's four button sack coat and forge cap because about 1862 on, you started to see a lot of uniforms felt like that. That was fairly typical because, again, you have to remember most of the troops at that time were volunteers. So you, were, you would have only seen so many guys in regular uniforms where everybody else is just wearing volunteer stuff. That makes sense? How often do you go to reenactments? Since 2020, the number has dropped considerably, of course. Um, it kind of depends. This year is actually looking very promising. Um, there's quite a few events between here, Oklahoma, uh, there's one in Larned, they're doing something in Larned. Not necessarily battles per se, but just living histories where people are getting a uniform or getting gear and going to doing stuff. So, as often as possible, as often as my bank account will allow. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you were on like the East Coast, you could do yeah. 10 events a year. East Coast, definitely. There's definitely a lot of stuff out there. The Everyone issue, forgets about what out yeah. west. The issue here is that you have to drive 10 plus hours to get to them. So that's a big, you know, mm -hmm. big thing to overcome. Right. And the government isn't is an issue with gas money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we're getting close to three o'clock. Um, but I was wondering, right before we were you were doing the presentation, you were telling me that a lot of the the volunteers from here in Kansas expected to be home guard as opposed to actual. Could you mind just saying a little bit so, about that? So, from what I've understood is the 8th Kansas Volunteer Infantry, when those guys signed up, when they enlisted, they enlisted as um, just like a home guard. Okay, there's something going on. We don't trust Missouri. Completely understandable. We don't trust Missouri. We're going to arm up and we're going to be prepared. And then the officer said, hey, um, by the way, we're going to send you guys out east. And there was a lot of them that were very upset about that. No, 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 no. We signed up to protect Kansas. And they said, that's great, but now you're going to protect Kentucky. 
So go on. And they marched them all the way out to Kentucky. They, Kansas fought in some of the biggest battles out, out west, like Chickamauga, Chattanooga, I can't remember, some of the Missionary Ridge. They fought at some of the big battles uh, in the Western theater, and they're kind of known for being pretty awesome, I mean, for a lack of a better term. Right? When they all enlisted, they pretty much immediately got sent everywhere but Kansas. There were like two companies left in Kansas. They, one went to Nebraska, and one went into Colorado. They were just sent everywhere. Right. Uh, when they got sent east, they came back into Kansas, kind of formed up. They're like, hey, we're going to leave the state. And I think, and then and there's a book called Keep the Flag of the Front, and it says that a lot of them weren't happy about it, but they did it. I don't think there was a single one that deserted because of it, um, but they weren't happy. They signed three years' papers, so they went sent, were sent out east. Um, while they were out east, their three years were up, and then at the time, the military said, hey, if you guys want to be enlisted, you get veteran status, and you don't have a furlough, and all this. And I think at that time, quite a few of them were like, no, I'm done, like, this isn't what I signed up for. So some of them just left, but I think the eight still held a lot of numbers. They, they all, a lot of them signed back up, and they kind of kept, it right at the end of the war at that point, they kind of kept fighting in that central Texas. But, the book specifically says that they weren't happy, but they did it anyways. And a lot of the accounts of the Kansas Saudis were really good. They were, what, they were uh, provost in Nashville, I think. Mm -hmm. And at the time the military took, they were gonna move them out of Nashville. The citizens of Nashville said, no, we want them to stay here. They were the best one we had. Which kind of goes against some of what you've always heard, I think, from the Civil War. You know, you imagine these Southern cities and the Federals come in and. You think of like God with the wind, go, ah, Yankees, you know, a lot of them went, no, 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 you're, you're cool, you can cool. stay, stay, because we don't want to deal with the ramifications if you leave, just stay here. So, in Kansas was one of those units where, like I said, Nashville, the, the, citizens, the citizens of Nashville went to the military and said, no, can we keep those Kansas boys around? We, we kind of like that. So, I do not, um, but I can recommend, and if you talk to me after, I might be able to write, you know, a couple of down. Um, the one that Mr. French here mentioned is Keep the Flag to the Front by Bill McFarlane. Uh, he's, he just retired not long ago, but he was a high school history teacher for many years. Wonderful guy. He's done an extensive amount of research on the 8th Kansas Infantry during the American Civil War. Uh, that is a wonderful, wonderful book if you're interested in a Civil War regiment uh, during the war. Um, a couple that I personally brought along. Um, this is a really great one. Ooh, Civil War nice. <laughs> Hard Tack and Coffee by John, was it John, Billings? John Billings. So John Billings served in a, I think it was Massachusetts Artillery Unit during the war. And he goes chapter by chapter explaining, this is what our food was like, this is what corporal punishment looks like, this is what our uniforms were like. He does a, a very, very great job. Uh, plus, there's some really great illustrations on the inside by another veteran from the war. And uh, those are, it, it's a, a great resource. There's even music, Breakfast Call, I think is that one, for artillery, infantry. That sort of thing. So this is a great resource. Hard tack and coffee is a really good one. Um, another one that I have personal reasons for absolutely adoring. It's called the Iron 44th. So this is about the 44th Indiana. They were out of uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. They fought in all of the big major battles in the Western theater, everything west of the Mississippi. And if you want a fantastic example of what it was like for a Western Regiment during the war. This is a good one. Not only because it gets you, you know, extensive information about the regiment, but also it's in their own words. There's letters that they wrote back to the newspapers and back to loved ones in LaGrange County, and they're all compiled in this book. So that's also a really great one. It's something, all of these items that we show, not everyone was issued great coats. Not everyone was issued blankets. Not everyone was issued, you know, the same items. That's part of the reason why, for this presentation, we made sure that our uniforms are a little bit different, weapons are a little bit different, we're carrying our gear a little bit differently, and that sort of thing. We kind of show you guys an example of that. 
Uh, one of the stories that I can tell you uh, real quickly about the 44th Indiana, they were never issued tents. They were never issued the wedge tents. They were never issued the shelter house. So they were on campaign. It snowed about four or five inches. The surgeon comes out of his tent. He's looking around. Where is everybody? And then he saw the snow drift starting to move. The men just, all they had were their blankets. And at that time, they had holes in their uniforms, they had holes in their boots. Some guys didn't have boots at all. And they were still going. Uh, the, the men that fought in that war were of a completely different breed. I cannot imagine the, the fortitude that those men, those men had. I mean, just imagine looking at the top of a hill, seeing the enemy entrenched and going, there's a very, 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 very high chance that I'm not going to make it out of this and say, okay, let's go. I can't imagine. Just imagine that. Right. Uh, yeah, Valley Forge, yeah. something kind of like that. Yeah, that, the, that's the imagery that I kind of imagined too when I read that account of the surgeon talking about the guys coming out of the snow drifts, knocking the snow off their blankets. These are five pound wool blankets, but they're not, they don't keep you that long. So I imagine those guys were pretty miserable. Okay, well that might be a good, good place to Absolutely. stop. Uh, appreciate your friends coming out. And, and Our pleasure. Uh, they'll be around a little bit to, to chat with you and, and you can come up and take a look at some of their things, and, and, and which should be a lot more fun, too. Um, in the 13th of February, um, I'll be doing a presentation on the, called The Bicycle, The Aid to Women's Independence. So hopefully you'll come out and, and listen to that as well. So thank you so much for coming out with this.